cream teas, bunting, the local shop, quaint church spires, and games on the green. I suppose people have an idea of what the perfect village should be, but real villages are far more fascinating. I've lived in a village for 38 years now, and I know there's more to village life than the picture postcard suggests. They never get a bit tipsy. Oh, no. So I'm off for another summer, exploring the world of our smallest communities. I bet you wish you were here with me. From way down low... Wow! ...to up on high... Oh, I see! Yes, there is! I'll seek out the people and places that have made a big impact. The things I do for television. My inspiration is the Batsford Guides, whose words and pictures from the 1930s offer a window to the past. But I'm discovering what it means to be a village today, and it's incredible how rich and varied our country is. The more I see, the more curious I am. Why do we all love this quintessentially British institution? It's lovely, isn't it? There are 10,000 villages across our country, and I found them in some unlikely spots. Tumbling down cliffs, hidden amongst the downs, and around unexpected corners. But I've come to an area where I'm told villages exist in some extraordinary places, and for the most unusual of reasons. The thing I love about these journeys is to look out of the window and you nearly always know where you are. And I'm in Scotland, on the west coast. This is Argyll and Butte, a wonderfully confusing landscape where fingers of land twist around deep sea locks. A place where boats are as essential as cars. And home to the most challenging village locations I've ever encountered. It is an area I hadn't known very much before. But it is absolutely stunning. Caught between Glasgow, Loch Lomond and the much-loved Western Isles, Mainland Argyll and Butte is an area that often gets overlooked. I want to learn why some remarkable villages here exist at all, and understand how locals keep their remote communities thriving. My trusty Batsford guide as ever accompanies me, and they say of this area, the widely dispersed villages usually consist of little more than a single street of low, whitewashed houses following the main road or fronting on a lock, with a general shop, a school, and one or more small kirks. That's church to you and me. Well, I can tell already that villages are widely dispersed because standing between me and my first destination is the small challenge of Lochfine. I could drive 85 miles right around the top of it, or I could take the 25-minute ferry ride. It's no competition, really. I'm driving down onto the ferry. More ferry journeys are made in this region than any other part of Scotland. They're the lifeblood of the area. May I pay? And on a day like today, they're the perfect chance to see where I'm heading. I bet you wish you were here with me. Isn't it gorgeous? 
and I'm on a ferry, one of my favorite things. On the far side of the loch, I'm on my way to Scotland's most famous peninsula. Over that side, running right, right down for about 50 miles, is Kintyre. And the mall, which we have all sung about since 1977 with the mist rolling in from the sea, is at the very, very end of it. All of McCartney recorded his famous tune in the barn of his farmhouse, which, appropriately enough, is very near the mull, or tip, of Kintyre Peninsula. The song has ensured this finger of land is known right around the world. But I'm off to the harbour at the other end of this peninsula. I've reached Talbot. This is my first village, and the sun shining. There's something rather special about arriving at a place by the sea, and Talbot's connection with the sea is everything. Older buildings in the village are found close to the harbour. Later buildings had to fill in the space behind, as Talbot grew slowly up the hillside. But I'm climbing above them all. This is the most marvellous way to get the lay of the land, well, lay of the sea. There's Loch Fine over there, and this provides the most amazing natural harbour. So people happening upon here, as they must have done in years gone by, would have thought, this is the perfect place to leave my fishing boat. And they did. The village we see today developed thanks to what was once Argyll and Butte's most important industry, herring fishing. A thousand people now live here and enjoy a host of independent shops. One of them is run by lifelong villager Ian McIntyre. Nice to see you. From his shop window, Ian has watched the fishing fleet for decades and has amassed a record that stretches way back. This one is... No, that, I'm guessing, at 1875. A lot of fishing boats. A lot of fishing boats. Turbot was built on the catch of Harry yes, mostly. Yeah. By the early 1900s, the harbour was home to 88 fishing boats, each with a four-man crew. By the time Ian was a lad, the size of each boat had grown. That's the photograph I took, I think it was 1952. What a lot of fishing boats. A lot of fishing boats. I mean, at one point, they reckoned you could cross the harbour on the boats from one side to the other. On foot? Yeah. All the people must have been connected with fishing in some way. One way or another, you were connected with fishing. I mean, as shopkeepers, quite often you were getting herring scales in the till. Oh, really? Yes. So you had to clear out the till every so often to get the scales. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean... A welcome sight. Of yeah. course, people were spending the money. That's where the money was coming from. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, you're welcome. The natural harbour has certainly shaped recent times in Tarbot, but there's a notorious chapter in local history that helps explain why there's been a settlement here for centuries. Hello, are you Vikings? Tarbot stands at the narrowest point on the Kintyre Peninsula. Just a mile of land separates one sea lock from the next. And the village now celebrates the extraordinary events of 1098. That's all right, don't worry. Whilst England was getting used to life under the Normans, the west coast of Scotland was beset by Viking longship raids. Did you make it yourself? He did. Did you? It looks quite seaworthy. It is. It is very seaworthy. (laughs) 
Ships like these were the scourge of communities from the Orkneys to the Isle of Man. Oh, it's lovely having Vikings to help me. <laughs> My rather Viking-esque tiller man oh. is called Hans Koch. Whose idea was this amazing boat? Well, there's a general idea on the pub with friends. <laughs> Every year we organize a festival for traditional boats. Oh, really? Yes, boats from all over the UK come over here. But after three times we thought it was a bit boring to do the same thing all the time. So we started thinking, what can we do to add something? <laughs> The village turned to the legendary story of Magnus Barefoot, the young king of Norway. His repeated raids left the lord of the Scottish Isles almost powerless around here. So he proposed a deal. They agreed that all the land that Magnus Barefoot could sail around with his boat, on, with him on the helm, he could call his. But Magnus knew his local geography and saw this spot as an opportunity. He thought, well, I can bring my boat over from the Westloch to this Eastloch, and then the whole of Kantaya Peninsula is mine too. So that's what he did. With Magnus standing at the helm, the Vikings picked up his longship and carried it between the two locks. He turned Kintyre into an island which they were now free to plunder at will. You see, that's clever. That's clever. The name Tarbot actually means carry a cross. And many have chosen to follow the Viking example in preference to sailing around the Mull. But since 2014, the village festival has seen their local legend reenacted with a longship dragged overland from the far lock through the village to the harbour. Do all the villagers join in? Yeah, but we've got a waiting list now that want to be in 2017, they want to be involved. They do? So, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Give it going. Oh. For a violent and devious plunderer, it seems Magnus Barefoot is remembered rather fondly these days. I enjoyed it, and I do hope you don't all ache tomorrow. <laughs> it's amazing how 900 years can soften the memories. My first village in Argyll and Butte, and what a one to pick. This perfect harbour that once was absolutely solid with fishing boats. Now yachts and still some fishing boats working. And after meeting the Vikings, still a wonderful sense of community. I've got an awful lot more to explore. Next, I see the communities of Scotland's most beautiful shortcut. Is it terribly heavy? It's quite heavy. You get used to it. <laughs> and I find a postcard English village built by Butte's richest family. Oh, that's amazing. I'm exploring the beautiful land and coast of Argyll and Butte and finding out how villages came to be in some unlikely spots. As my Batsford guide said, many overlook the deep sea lochs of the region. But heading north of the Kintyre Peninsula, you find a string of villages that face a rather different waterway. The Crinan Canal. There are canals all over Britain. But none of them are quite like this one. You won't see any narrow boats on this canal. Most of the boats you see are seagoing yachts. This canal is all about connecting Loch Fyne to the Atlantic. The nine-mile route 
rises from sea level to 65 feet and back down again, passing through 15 locks and under seven swing bridges. But in particular, the canal boasts five villages and hamlets. And today, I'm taking a short trip from Bellanoch to the canal's westernmost end, the village of Crinan. Andy is to be my skipper. Welcome aboard. Whilst Alec worked on the canal for almost 40 years. That's you clear. And there isn't much he doesn't know about its comings and goings. So the Crinan Canal runs through this line here. Right. And the reason it was built was that shortcut made it an awful lot safer than trying to battle your way around the Mull of Kintyre in four or six gales in the winter. I was in Tarbus, yes. <laughs> and I was told that this Viking king yeah. cut across here with oh. his boat. From East there. Loch to West Loch. So the Crinan Canal does exactly the same thing. Yes, Britain's most beautiful shortcut. Alec may just be right. But in 1801, beauty wasn't a concern for this industrial highway. Cargo boats and fishing vessels serving the needs of Glasgow and the Clyde were the daily traffic. But they built things to last in those days. I find it so exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it terribly heavy? It's quite heavy. You get used to it. <laughs> Keeps you fit. Uh, exactly. The canal was built through wild countryside. A good few people were quickly needed to keep the locks and bridges opening. But in 1847, something happened that changed life here forever. It was really put on the map when Queen Victoria did the royal route. Wonderful. Yeah. The Empress Queen, Albert, and the royal children were touring the west coast and realized the canal was a handy shortcut. With crowds watching, they boarded a decorated horse-drawn barge and, like me, set off for Crinan. They gave the industrial canal a royal seal of approval, and the crowds followed. To give you an idea of how it changed the villages, within a fairly short space of time, 40,000 people followed that route. To be fair, the tourists didn't have far to come. Magnificent steamers from Glasgow were already running trips up and down Loch Fyne. These steamers now docked at the canal's entrance, Ardrishig, to offload passengers keen to follow the royal route to Crinan. You came up on the steamer to the terminus at Ardrishig. If you go down to the buildings, it's the wee restaurant today. That was for the passenger control onto the ferries. Really? Then there was the canal boat, the Linnet. Its job was merely plying up and down with passengers. The little Linnet became a much-loved boat. It moved gracefully at walking pace allowing visitors the time to take everything in and plenty of time to spend their money. Hotels and small communities started to appear, like at Cairn Barn, where a chain of locks meant tourists had time to peruse new shops and watch locals perform highland dances, for a few coins, of course. On my journeys, most villages have grown up because of the building of something. Roads, of course, but the villages along here happened because of this canal. I'm approaching my destination of Crinan. Thank you very much. You're welcome where today's locals are still on hand to make sure visitors like me enjoy our trip. This is Katie, who is the lock keeper. 
Do you do this every year? Yeah, so I, I, this is my second season, so I'm a student, so I um, come back in the, in the summer when the weather's like Lovely. this, hopefully. Yes, yes that's It's not that's always the like this. <laughs> no, for, funnily <laughs> enough, Crennan <laughs> does not have its own wee microclimate. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> yeah. So if you press I'll this press button for one. me, and I'll get this one, and you'll slowly hear them clinking, crunching open. It's like creaky joints. It's a lovely sight, watching the yacht sail into our village destination. This is the Crinan Yacht Basin, and the village of Crinan after which the canal is named. With a cafe, an improbably large hotel, and a lighthouse for those carrying on out to sea, for 200 years, Crinan has been a very pretty canal service station. It's lovely, isn't it? You see, you think when this canal was first built, it would have been a hive of activity with lots of people working. Now it's just people enjoying themselves. But there's no rest for my skipper. Come on, galley slave. That's really yeah, the gentleman. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Alec remembers a time when the yachts mixed with the last of the working boats. The one thing that I really remember was the smell of Crinan has changed, strangely enough. Fishermen tended to be a wee bit untidy at times, so the nets were left at the back of the basin. And on a day like this, they got a bit whiffy. The odd leisure yacht came in and commercials and leisures just don't mix. So really? it, it made for an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get better views than that, do you? From this enchanting village out to sea, and the Western Islands. Wow. Time for me to wave goodbye to Alec and Andy. As they head out to adventures at sea. Well, it's dry land for me, and into my car to continue my journey. But of course, even a road trip involves some seafaring in these parts. There are more inhabited islands here than in any other part of Scotland. But there's only one whose name carries across this whole region. I'm heading to the Butte of Argyle and Butte. This island is as close to Glasgow as I'll be on this journey. But development here has been fiercely controlled. Despite this, I'm heading to a village that was born out of love. I see signs of habitation. There's a half-timbered house. How extraordinary. Kerry Croy overlooks a loch. But that's where comparisons with other local villages end. It's perfectly symmetrical, with just seven buildings placed in a curve around a village green. It's rather designed, isn't it? And I don't think I've seen many half-timbered houses beside the sea. This looks very un-Scottish to me. I must find out more about it. The key to Kerry Croy's unique look, in fact, to understanding the whole of Butte, is hidden in the trees a short walk away. Life is full of surprises. And this certainly is one. In the middle of a, a clearing, this extraordinary house. Mount Stuart is the most outrageous of Scottish houses and the seat of the Marquises of Butte. The family still owns most of the island today, 
But their wealth and power in the 19th century was legendary. In South Wales, for instance, they developed docks and a coal trade in a market town. That market town grew to become the Welsh capital, Cardiff. In the 1880s, they celebrated their status with this. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, look, it's like the Star Chamber up there. There's amazing pillars. Mount Stuart is said to contain more Italian marble than any other house in Britain. It was the first home in Scotland to be lit by electricity and possibly the first anywhere to boast a modern heated indoor pool. More recently, in 2003, the McCartney family popped across from Kintyre for a secretive family wedding. Mystery shrouded the wedding of Stella McCartney. The re-entrance of the stately home is manned by guards. The only sign that the wedding was actually happening was the arrival of a string of showbiz stars onto the island. Celebrities including Madonna and Kate Moss opted to travel here in style on the local ferry. But I'm not here in search of celebrity weddings. I'm meeting the head of historic collections, Alice Martin, to learn who we should thank for Mount Stuart's unusual village neighbour. When we're talking about Kerry Croy, it's yes. definitely the second Marquess and Marchioness of Butte. She's pretty. She is. Where was she from? Well, she's the daughter of the third Earl of Guildford. Guildford? Guildford. Gosh, yes. I live near Guildford. Okay. So it's very different from Butte than from Guildford. There used to be a village nearer to this house. The family wanted a bit more privacy, so they decided to build a bigger village um, yeah. further away from the house. She was, I think, a little homesick, so her husband, ever romantic, actually helped her to develop the sort of English style down there that you see. Hence the half Croy. Tudor. Absolutely, the mock Tudor um, it down there. It's lovely. We have a, an album, we don't know how it came into the collection, but it probably has our earliest photo from Kerry Croy. From her dress, I would guess that was around 1880s. Yes, of course. Um, and there you can see the timber properties, the schoolhouse and the pub, which is still there. From all accounts, they had an extremely loving marriage. It was a love match, so I think he wanted to do everything to make her feel at home. I think the second Marquis pulled off a rare feat. He looked after his workers with new housing, but simultaneously made his wife very happy indeed. I am in Scotland. I can tell by the mountains and the locks of the ferries. But maybe this reminded that lovely lady a bit of Surrey. No chocolates or roses for her. Just imagine a village as a gift. Next, I catch a glimpse of a bygone era. Isn't it glorious? And discover a village in need of a helping hand. Isn't it funny how someone goes into a garden and picks even two or three weeds? You think, oh, God bless them. I'm halfway through a Scottish adventure, crossing lochs, jumping on and off islands, and climbing hills to find the wonderful villages of Argyll and Butte. Best of all, I'm indulging my love of fairies. You can smell the sea, it's wonderful. This fairy is taking me to a traditional parish. It has a village, surrounding farms and a manor house but it's three miles offshore and affairs here are run in a most unusual way 
I've seen the milk and the newspapers. I suppose those go over to the local shop every day, and that's the only way of getting provisions. Kia is six miles long and home to 160 residents. The island is known for its turquoise waters and white sandy bays, where, it's rumored, our queen liked to anchor on her summer cruises. It's only nice to walk along a road with a view like that, hardly anyone around. Look at the wildflowers this year. And all you can hear is bees buzzing and birds tweeting. I'm heading straight to the heart of the community. The grocery store. Oh, look, a duck egg. But it's also the post office. The off-license. I love cheeky with red. Yes. <laughs> the hardware shop. A petrol station. And, luckily for me, cappuccino with the ground. Sure. Joe, the owner, makes a jolly good coffee as well. It's the shop with everything. Kia is a thriving community, but it's not always been like this. Long ago, Highland clans passed control of the island back and forth. More recently, a succession of land-owning lairds have bought and sold the island and its property for profit. By the turn of the millennium, roads and housing on Gia were in a sorry state. And the residents said, enough. When Gia came on the market again in 2002, they took matters into their own hands. Henry Macaulay runs the island's art gallery. Well, that's a nice place to have tea. She knows how the villagers felt at the time. When the buyout happened, there were 87 people on Gia. Really? And most of them were retired. So there weren't a great many people with experience of big business or no, anything like that. We were fishing and farming. It's an enormous stat, isn't huge it? Huge thing. Yeah, huge. The villagers raised four million pounds and started a new chapter in Gia's history. They established a trust, which now ensures everyone has a say in how the island is run. The membership is everybody in the yes, island that wants to be involved. You can be deciding about somebody's drains one minute and spending a million pounds on something the next minute. That's wonderful. We have a ballot box, so if we need to take a vote, it's a secret, so we can all live together. <laughs> Gia's villagers have certainly been bold, and they've had vision too. A mile down the lane, there's a first for me. Andy Oliver is Gia's man in charge of renewable energy. So, these are the dancing ladies of gear. The three on the right-hand side are our original three turbines that we bought second-hand. Right. And the grey one we put up just over two years ago. There was no one who said, don't Basket do that to beautiful gear. It was unanimously accepted. People were more concerned that the housing that they were living in was below tolerable standard. People were living in houses that were mouldy and damp. It was, it's not yeah. acceptable. So this was one way of producing some income. Power produced by the dancing ladies is sold to the national grid. Meanwhile, the village boasts snug, warm eco-houses. And new developments which have encouraged families to join the community. They have literally seen the winds of change. Enormous, aren't they? I've never seen a wind turbine this close to. It's quite noisy. I suppose if you live somewhere like Gia and you want to generate some money, 
they're a good idea. I can't leave without seeing what the villagers have done with the former centerpiece of the island. Ackermore House was the traditional Scottish baronial home of the laird. But in these egalitarian times, the huge 54-acre gardens have become another potential fundraiser. The plants are all here, but so are rather a lot of weeds. See, all these grasses should come out. And really, although the fox cubs are lovely, I don't think they were meant to be here. The lilies were, of course. Just a few. Isn't it funny how someone comes into your house and does a bit of dusting, you get insulted. But if someone goes into a garden and picks even two or three weeds, you think, oh, God bless them. The plan has been to open the gardens to paying visitors. But with the focus so far going on vital infrastructure, it's fallen to volunteers like Malcolm to hold back the weeds. Good morning. Hello, good morning. How many gardeners do you think this would have had? The grass cutting, the weeding, the propagation, the greenhouses, glass houses. Well, there could have been up to a dozen people on the island do what they can but it's changed times and how from food supplies to housing and even formal gardening the community of gear has taken on the full gamut of responsibilities gear feels more like a small country in miniature rather than a village island it's fascinating meeting a community that have taken their destiny into their own hands. I wish them a great deal of luck and would like to come back in about 10 years and see how it's gone on. Time for me to return to the mainland. Drive back across Kintyre, catch another boat. I love ferries. And drive the final five miles to a village that is far more typical of this area. A classic of its kind, you could say. Tyne Bruick not only overlooks a loch, but stretches itself as far as possible along it and there's a distinctly Victorian air to its many villas. A clear nod to when this village took off. The West Coast steamers that beat a path to the Crinan Canal also stopped off here. And if you're very lucky today, you might just see their sole survivor. Isn't it glorious? And it's giving us goodbye. This is the Waverley, the world's last seagoing paddle steamer. They don't make them like that anymore. But whilst visitors continue to come and go here, I've come to investigate what the locals get up to. Surely this sports ground must have one of the best views in Great Britain. It's the home of Kyle's Athletic. And uh, the sport they play here is called Shinty. My Batsford guide describes the game brilliantly. This lively pastime might be called hockey in the rough, with no nonsense about it sticks and rules of a relatively free and easy kind. It's the sort of game that village boys might improvise with crooked boughs and a knot of wood on the common land in the evening. Now it produces representative teams in all sorts of improbable places throughout the north and west. And here 
in Tyne Abruig. The origins of Shinty arrived here with the Irish over a thousand years ago. Today there are 3,000 registered players and 38 of the 50 clubs are based in small communities like Tyne Abruig. If cricket rules south of the border, the village sport here is Shinty. At Kyle's Athletic, I've turned up in time to see the youngsters practice. Do you ever get hit? Sometimes, but it doesn't hurt for that long. It goes away, it's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I'll believe you. Barney Crawford has been coaching Tyner Bruick kids since he was a young player himself. How young is the youngest one here? He's five year old, the youngest one. Really? Uh, uh, we used to wait till they were primary five, but now we've got so few kids and children in place, we more or less take them out of the pram now. Eh? <laughs> These kids are the future of a club that regularly finishes near the top of the National League. The grateful parents have organised a surprise thank you to Barney for this season's coaching. Oh, what a prize. <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? Village life. But the more shinty players Tyner Bruick boasts, the more shinty sticks are needed. They're all handmade just five minutes walk away by the Blair family. I'm looking for a shinty stick maker. Oh, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm John. John's father started making sticks 38 years ago. But now it's John and his son Christopher who supply the club. It's a family craft that the village relies on. Here we have what you've been looking for, a finished shinty stick. Unlike cricket and hockey, shinty players use different sticks depending on the position they play in. So that is a forward stick. You have quite a flat face on that yes. stick. This stick, you have a more beveled face, which you right. play in yes. defence. And if you're lucky enough to be the daft person that stands in the goals to get the ball peppered at you 100 miles an hour, uh, this is the kind of stick you would use there. That's a lot of prayers. Yes. John's skill affects the quality and consistency of each stick. My aim is to try and follow the first lamination. Yeah. All the way around. Just by eye. Just by eye. No certainty. Gosh. One stick can take several days to make and sells for £45. Are you rich as creases through making shinty sticks? Certainly not at all. No. Joiners and builders, we actually lose money when we're in making shinty sticks. Really? Yeah. But we're trying to keep the cost down because it's an amateur sport okay. and because it's got to be affordable. And will you go on doing it even though it's not a profitable pastime? Yeah, but it's still a great thing to do. Well, bravo to the Blair family. And long may they keep Kyle's athletic richly supplied with shinty sticks. This is a wonderful gift we've prepared for you. Oh, that's wonderful. You can take that home and That's jolly nice. Well, I've got a son who lives in Scotland on the Black Isle, and I don't know if they have a shinty team. Well, they might be able to start they one. They might be able to start one, yeah. <laughs> that's a... Beautiful. Thank you. No bother at all, no bother. Take You're welcome. Care. Pleasure. You now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I always talk about village communities and this evening has been the classic example of that. It's marvellous to find a sport that is so localised to particular villages in an area of the United Kingdom. 
Next, I discover a village that really relies on its ferryman. Do you take the school children over school in the morning? Yeah, everything. <laughs> There's some cows and goats. <laughs> and that's become the unlikely home of competitive stone skimming. Have you skimmed stones before? Yes, uh -huh. since I was this big. We well, yes. should be quite good at this then. I shall do this only once. I'm on the final leg of my journey across Argyle and Butte. And I'm heading somewhere that sums up what an adventure this has been. I can see lots of islands over there. My last village is my least accessible yet. It's also my most northerly location, and more than any other begs the question of how it came to be. Easdale is one of two villages in Britain where you'll never find a car. Uh, this is the end of the road, so I'm headed for that island over there. For the last time, I am in search of a ferry. Easdale has won, but there's no sign of a timetable. Please push both buttons to call the ferry. Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and the worst of the Scottish weather are the only things that stop this ferry. Can I come aboard? Good. Easdale's 60 residents rely on this vital service. So I'm guessing none of them dare fall out with Alan, the village ferryman. Do you take the school children over school in the morning? Yeah, the secondary school kids, they go on the quarter eight ferry in the morning. Do you take dogs and things? Yeah, everything. There's <laughs> some cows and goats, ducks, hens. <laughs> At just 25 acres, Easdale is the smallest inhabited island of the Inner Hebrides, here on Scotland's west coast. But the island's not short of life. There's the post box. Monday to Friday collection, 10.15. No collection on Saturday. And wheelbarrows. Lovely coloured wheelbarrows. I suppose you get back on the ferry with all your shopping. Instead of carrying it to wherever you live, put it in a wheelbarrow, take it to your house. What a good idea. There are 71 homes here and one pub. Surprisingly, perhaps, there's also a museum and a concert hall. Oh, they do plays and things. And there's one thing this island does very well indeed. Slate everywhere. After the slate is quarried, it's split and dressed. The splitter rough shaping with chisel and mallet and the dresser cutting into the various sizes suitable for the market. For three centuries, this tiny island was the unlikely capital of Scottish slate, the most productive of what became known as the Slate Islands. In the 1700s, 500 people lived and worked as miners on Easdale, cutting roofing slates that were sent as far as Australia and Canada. Today, their legacy is seven quiet pools of water. Some of these quarries were over 300 feet deep, and the men had to go down and work in them in, I should think, awfully cold and grimy conditions. In the 1880s, there was a terrible storm, I imagine, blowing in from the Atlantic. And overnight, all these quarries were flooded. When the men woke up in the morning, their quarries had vanished. And all the tools of their trade were sunk. 
Legend has it that they're still there. With the industry gone, Easdale's population shrunk to just four. The village today has an entirely new community. Karen Cafferty has been here for nine years, running the island's only cafe and pub. We had a new baby born just two years ago, which is lovely, and we've got another couple on the way, which is great really? for the community. We do have problems with the wheelie bins floating about if it's a big spring tide, but that's yeah, only yeah. every so often. <laughs> <laughs> but the new village does have one strong connection with its past the miners' cottages. Everything you see is the slate spoil. Lovely slate roof. Yes, but it's glisten in the rain because we've got a really high percentage of iron pyrites in our slate here. So, really? What's yeah. that? Uh, iron pyrites, fool's gold. Oh, really? So, yeah. That's why you can recognise Eastdale slate because it has a very high percentage in it. With the sun shining, birds calling, and not a hint of road noise, it feels a little like this village is permanently on holiday. And tonight, it's competition night, which in Easdale takes place at the slate quarries. So, have you skimmed stones before? Yes. Uh -huh. Since I was this big. Excellent. Well, you yes. should be quite good at this, then. Oh, brilliant. With no room for a shinty field, Easdale has a very specific village sport. Oh, that's terrific! Some of the local talent is impressively young. Organising and adjudicating the contests falls to Donald Melville. These are marked every five metres. Oh, I see. Out yes. to the it's, end wall. It's not the number of skins, then. It's the... It's the distance of competition oh. measures, yes. But this is far more than just a village sport. Since 1983, up to 300 skimmers have come here from as far as Poland and India for the Stone Skimming World Championships. But tonight, it's all for fun, using nothing but what the slate miners left behind. Step up onto the Oki. Please keep quiet, seagulls. I shall do this only once. <laughs> Always quit when you're ahead. Fifteen. <laughs> How many? Fifteen. Gosh, that's not bad. Easdale is an inspiring place, a happy place perched on its own rocky outcrop. It's extraordinary. No roads on the island, very little else, but an amazing sense of community. People come here because they want to get away from it. They feel secure, safe, great life. From Vikings carrying boats to industrial canals, it's been fascinating to see how communities first appeared amongst this, the most complex landscape I've ever explored. I came to this region expecting pretty villages with beautiful mountains and locks, and I found all that. But it's the people I've met who will stick in my mind just as much as the scenery. I have great respect for all the villagers around here. They've really been creative. They've made wind farms that bring in income to a community which really needs it. And, of course, invented a stone skimming championship. <laughs> the villagers have certainly adapted to modern living. 
as well as all those marvellous ferrymen who get people about. Long may these villagers thrive. I've enjoyed myself. Next time, I'm over the moors. Wonderful. And down the dales, in search of the famous Yorkshire spirit. Water. There isn't an or an hour in water, <laughs> it's water. <laughs> I'll find the childhood home of Captain Cook. Fine figure of a man, isn't he? No shirt, North Yorkshire. Ooh. And I'll meet a Dales lady who bared all for her community. Your July. Yes, I always <laughs> say I'm the hottest nun. Award-winning, unreported world back this Friday in Yemen. Our weapons, devastating effects, an unseen war join Krishnan at 7.30. Might not be your dream, but it is for the kids. House of fun with fireman poles and revolving bookcase. Grand Designs is next.